Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of July 31st, 2015. Now, the big activity here this week has been attempting to stop and roll back a coup d'etat, a putsch, in golpe here in Washington. And this is, once again, the ISIS czar, General John Allen. He makes a specialty of doing cold coups, putches, policy putches at least, and end runs, except he does end runs around the president. And he does this in the service of a foreign power, that is to say Turkey under Erdogan, and to a very real, uh, in a re- very real sense, the Muslim Brotherhood. So the pattern was this. Uh, last Friday, approximately, Obama left on his African trip, going to Kenya and Ethiopia to address the organization, the, the African Union, talking about ISIS. But here in Washington, Allen the inside man of the Petraeus clique, right? Petraeus, General David Petraeus, the outside man, disgraced, now a felon, mishandled secret information. The inside man is Allen, and his network support is uh, is, uh, very great. It started off with this Monday story in the top right-hand corner of the Washington Post. Turkey and U.S. plan safe zone in Syria. Expanded air war on Islamic State. Turkey and the United States have agreed to the outlines of a de facto safe zone along the Turkey-Syrian border under the terms of a deal that is expected to significantly increase the scope and pace of the U.S. air war against the Islamic State in northern Syria, say U.S. officials. What U.S. officials? Well, Allen. Karen DeYoung and Liz Sly, how come your stenographers for the Alan Petraeus clique? Isn't the president still the commander in chief? Hey, you libertarians, you want the Constitution? Well, the president is supposed to be the commander in chief. So uh, this is a war brewing. This is a wider war. So um, The idea of this was obviously, we have a very convenient map here in the Washington Post of July 27th, page A8. This map has then been put on MSNBC by Rachel Maddow and Richard Engel. You can see the problem faced by the uh, NATO imperialist coalition. The Kurds, these gallant fighters, hats off to the Kurds, be they the PKK Kurds, uh, active more towards the uh, eastern part of this theater, be it the uh, KYG Kurds, I guess they are, in Syria, they have virtually closed the Turkish-Syrian border to the ISIS supply lines. The Kurds, through battles like Kobane and other towns, the Kurds have virtually cut the ISIS supply line. The only area where ISIS can still get supplies recruits, dupes, fanatics, psychotics into northern Syria and money in and oil out is between Jarabulis on the Euphrates River and uh, Azaz over there on the uh, uh, in, in the upper uh, the northwest corner of uh, Turkey, right? Jarabulis to Azaz. That's the window. And the so-called safe zone Take a look on the map. Take a look at an excellent map that we have on tarpley.net. You'll see that that's the area that the the, uh, safe zone or the terrorist haven, terrorist safe haven, ISIS safe haven, and ISIS supply line, that's the area they propose to secure, to keep that door open. Because once the Kurds control the entire length of the Turkish-Syrian border, ISIS will be cut off. Their supply lines will be cut off, and that will be the end of them. Now, interestingly, Allen, just like his dishonored friend uh, Petraeus, is also a liar uh, over the last couple of days. 
ISIS czar, this is a quote now from a press account, ISIS czar General John Allen met with Turkish delegates earlier this month, resulting in contradictory reports over the status of establishing a no-fly zone over Syria. Allen said, no, it was not part of the discussion. Liar. But Turkish publications claimed that Ankara got what it wanted in the negotiation, which was a no-fly zone, which they have now uh, received. So uh, this was essentially putting two and two together. Obama has been opposed to this. Obama goes out of town. And then it's announced it's got to be Allen. And sure enough, the confirmation came the next day. Highly informed, well-informed, highly reliable Middle East source writes me, your information fits together with what I have learned on Friday before going to Africa. Obama called Erdogan of, Erdogan of Turkey and threatened to kick Turkey out of NATO if the Turkish president were to refuse to first immediately abandon his natural gas pipeline contract with Russia, that is South, South Stream or Turkish Stream. Now, this you can see this, this is an authentic report. So it shows that this is a mixed. Obama is, of course, a mixed proposition. He's opposing things that really he shouldn't be wasting his time with. And two, and this is the valid one, immediately stop supporting ISIS. Obama then flew to Africa. Allen, and this is still the uh, highly, highly informed Middle East source, Allen then conspired with Erdogan to create the no-fly zone and to carry out the bombing operations against the PKK, that is the Turkish Workers' Party armed militants in northern Iraq primarily. These two objectives aim at implementing the Robin Wright plan, W-R-I-G-H-T. This is this, this uh, uh, veteran lady journalist uh, now at the U.S. Institute of Peace. So the Robin Wright plan comes down to this. A Kurdish, a Kurdish state in Iraq and Syria, but not in Turkey. And a Sunnistan, this is essentially ISIS, ISIL, IS, Caliphate, Daesh, uh, in Iraq and Syria, while also sabotaging the U.S.-Iran nuclear accord. And we know that we have those army intelligence uh, notes about the, uh, the possibility and the advisability of creating such a Sunni stand. Now, uh, the other thing is that we're told once again by the well-informed source, Obama responded by repudiating Allen, saying, no, I don't support Allen, and by appointing Michael Ratney, R-A-T-N-E-Y, as his special envoy for Syria. Now, this is hopefully somebody who's going to stand up to Allen, but you get the idea here. The president is not able to fire Allen. What have we got here? An insurrection? How many insubordinate officers? How many disloyal officers? How many traitors? Are there in the Pentagon? What's going on here? Subversive, sedition going on. The president can't get his own policy. Is it uh, as a result of the many security breaches with the rotten uh, bureaucrats of the Secret Service? What is going on here? Well, it's what you've been hearing from, from this broadcast uh, week by week over the past uh, several months. Now, the Robin Wright plan, again, this is something that she published in the New York Times, September 28th, 2013. We could quibble about whether she's really the author of this. Does, the, does it come from these somewhat less presentable figures, uh, Frederick Kagan, Jack Keane, Petraeus? Does it come from other members of the Kagan family? Right? That includes Victoria Nuland. Anyway, Robin Wright puts it out. Uh, so that's that. Now, the other interesting story we have is that um, we'll get to it in just a second, that Erdogan's two children are both part of Daesh. And Erdogan may indeed be the supreme commander of Daesh. Erdogan actually may be the real caliph. He's got a regent going there in Raqqa. Back in a minute. World Crisis Radio, it's the afternoon of the 31st of August, 20. 15. Now, just in terms of the chronology of the week, the uh, story here about U.S. and Turkey planning a safe zone, it means Allen, ISIS czar General John Allen and Erdogan of the Muslim Brotherhood are planning an operation to smash the Kurds and to pr protect ISIS. 
The main thing is then push ISIS east, push ISIS towards Iran, push ISIS indeed towards the Caucasus, Transcaucasus, push it towards Chechnya and such places. Now, uh, on uh, Wednesday evening, on the PBS NewsHour, here we get what was presumably now a member of this clique around Allen. This would be NATO Supreme Commander General Philip Breedlove, interviewed on the PBS NewsHour, questioned by Gwen Eiffel. And she asks him, uh, is there a safe haven? Is there no fly zone in northern Syria? And amazingly enough, Breedlove simply says, oh, no, there's no such thing. That's not what we're doing. I don't know where you got that. And, of course, this uh, feckless Gwen Eiffel with her softball uh, uh, sweetheart interview style when dealing with illustrious warmongers simply let it pass. Right? So a, a real howler, a blatant lie. So uh, Breedlove, an important guy, right, the U.S. European Command and the NATO Supreme Command, too. So it's more than that. Um, we've got uh, Thierry Maison of the Voltaire Network also supplementing this with some very interesting information. Uh, it turns out that the daughter of Erdogan, Sumeye Erdogan, uh, is the uh, administrator of a secret hospital for terrorists. This includes Al Qaeda and ISIS in a place called San Liurfa, S-A-N-L-I-U-R-F-A, just a little bit north of the border. This town has already uh, got a secret Al-Qaeda training camp, and they bring the wounded ISIS fighters in there. They're brought in by the MIT, Mili Ishtibarat Teskalati, National Intelligence Organization of Turkey. Uh, this is under the daughter of Erdogan, and we are now told by the leader of the Republican People's Party, CHP, this guy's name is Gersel Tekin, we're told that the crude oil stolen by ISIS in especially Iraq is being exported by BMZ, the shipping company controlled by Bilal Erdogan, the son of President Erdogan. So President Erdogan's son is shipping the oil and making money violation of resolution 2170 of UN Security Council. So a daughter runs the hospital for the wounded ISIS fighters and the son does the exporting of the of the stolen oil. So now remember, keep your eye on the big picture. The goal is to protect the ISIS supply lines. Turkey claims to be threatened. They say, oh, if the Kurds control the entire Syrian side of our border with Syria, that's a threat to us. Baloney. It's a threat to ISIS because at that point, ISIS would begin to collapse. I have repeatedly called on this program, Turkey, U.S. must issue ultimatum to Turkey, close that border, seal it hermetically, nothing gets through. Neither way, nix. Obama seems to have done something of uh, something like what I said. Uh, good, but now make it stick. Fire Allen. And the point about that is, and let's, uh, let's always remember, hashtag fire Allen for the number four ISIS, all caps. Hashtag fire Allen for number Arabic for ISIS. Okay. So the goal of this is to protect the ISIS supply lines and to push ISIS east, because if you bomb the PKK in northern Iraq, that lets ISIS get in there because you've weakened the main force that's going to fight them. So they're trying to push ISIS east, and of course they want to smash the Kurds, because the Kurds are having great military success against ISIS. All of that hype, all of that stuff about how sophisticated, invincible ISIS was. They're 10 feet tall. They have magical powers. No. The Kurds are defeating them left and right. There was also a story that the Kurds, there was a column of Kurds that was getting very close to Raqqa, the capital of the terrorist ISIS entity, right? The Islamic State, the Caliphate, whatever you want. So we had the mockery of a special NATO meeting on Tuesday, a rare event. Uh, no no uh, troops sent, but uh, political cover for these madmen. We have today... Uh, a 
impudent, lying op-ed by Davut Tolio. Remember, Erdogan is now the president. His foreign minister, Davut Tolio, has now moved up to be prime minister, at least for the moment. And here we find the following barefaced lies. Fighting terrorists with every means. Yeah, who's that? You? No, not you. Turkey, he says, has been fully committed to the fight against Daesh, ISIS, since this monstrous organization first reared its ugly head. How come your president has his son and daughter working for them? No other NATO country has had to share a border with Daesh. Well, that's your own doing. Uh, we have already been deploying our national assets and capabilities to degrade this terrorist organization. Now we're also told, who, who do we blame for this? Don't we blame you? Don't we blame Turkey for for being a safe haven and a supply line? Oh, no. Um, we should look at the circumstances that led to the rise of Daesh, ISIS. And uh, who colludes with it? <laughs> who colludes? You. Look in the mirror when it suits their purpose. Syria cannot be salvaged until the regime in Damascus abdicates power. It's Assad. It is the Assad regime, yes, says Debutolio, that is responsible for the carnage and the chaos that led to the emergence of Daesh. And the fertile ground for radicalization cannot be eradicated until Bashar al-Assad and his circle of cronies leave. This is absolutely absurd. The U.S. has got to butt out of this, kick them out of NATO, fire Allen, and uh, take this, indeed, take this back to the NATO uh, council. So uh, another part of the same idiotic policy, the, the, the U.S. attempt to create more fighters for the Free Syrian Army has run into a small problem. The Nusra Brigade, that is Al-Qaeda, Division 30, I'm sorry, the Nusra Brigade has captured the uh, commander uh, of the Free Syrian Army, Division 30. <laughs> this is called the U.S.-backed new Syrian force, right, the puppet force created by the U.S., taking these terrorists, right, be they Nusra or ISIS, and then putting putting them in slightly different uniforms. Um, what In the course of this, uh, uh, su suggest if you're interested in the military details especially, there's a group called SyrianPerspective.org. Take a look at uh, that. So we've got uh, the son and the daughter... Uh, and interestingly enough, when oh, this method, the methodology, as I think I mentioned, the methodology of Allen, wait till Obama's out of the country and then try a bureaucratic end run. He tried it when Obama was in Australia. Remember the Brisbane no? At that point, they tried to mount a policy review to start the bombing of Syria, but that also didn't work. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, and now we have a very special guest. This is Thierry Maison, M-E-Y-S-S-A-N, if you want to type it in. He is the leading personality of the Voltaire Network, the Réseau Voltaire. He's the organizer of the Axis of Peace Conference in Brussels 10 years ago this uh, autumn. And he has been for quite a number of years now in the Middle East, in Lebanon, but in recent years, especially in Syria. He's going to speak to us from Damascus, and he uh, is actually uh, currently not just a journalist, but also an advisor to the Syrian government. So we want to welcome Thierry and uh, get his view on what we talked about in the first two segments, that is this question of ISIS czar John Allen, Erdogan of Turkey, and this uh, no-fly zone terrorist mm -hmm. uh, haven in uh, northern Syria, and, and how this was done, because he has some in very interesting source reports about that. Thierry, welcome. We're mm -hmm. delighted to have you. Hello, what's up? Yes, uh, here in the Middle East, uh, since two years, we have this um, secret negotiation with the, the U.S. and Iran. And uh, uh, the 14th of July, I signed an agreement. Of course, there is a public agreement about uh, nuclear issues with the five plus one and Iran. But there is also a secret agreement between only the U.S. and Iran about how they will manage together the Middle East. And uh, according to the secret agreements, uh, 
they will decrease the tension in Syria and also probably in Iraq, but sure in Syria. And of course, uh, inside the Obama administration, some people who are opposed to the um, to the agreement with Iran are trying to sabotage this uh, agreement, and especially, uh, you know, um, by the past, it was uh, the same situation in 2012, during the first Geneva Conference in June 2012, we signed a kind of peace, and immediately, uh, General Petreus, General Allen, and Hillary Clinton sabotaged everything, and they restart the war with the French, and Qatar. And right now, General Allen tried to restart again the war with Turkey. Uh, the idea of General Allen was to realize what we call the Alain Juppé and Robin Wright plan, which is uh, the idea to create a new Sinistan inside Iraq and uh, uh, inside the Syrian desert with, uh, with Daesh, with the uh, Islamic Emirate, and right. in the north of Syria and in Iraq, the Kurdistan. But you have to understand that the Kurdish people is divided in two groups totally different. The Kurdish people in Turkey and in Syria, they are from the left side during the, the Cold War, they were supporting uh, the, the Soviet and they were supported by the Syrians. But the, um, the Kurdish from Iraq, they are linked to Israel, the Darzani family, they are a member of the Mossad since the 50s, and uh, uh, they are always supporting the U.S. So, Jerry, let me just ask you now, are you talking about the Barzani government of that yes. quasi-Kurdish state or, or and or the PKK? Uh, the PKK is the left side in, in uh, Turkey and Syria, and the Barzani family is the right side in, uh, in Iraq only. And the two groups... They are not, they, they don't have the same language at all. But two different groups uh, of Turkish, of or Kurdish people. We, we say the Kurds, but uh, in fact, that's two different people. So the idea of General Allen was to create a Kurdistan uh, in Iraq with a part of Syria and not in, uh, in Turkey, but... Uh, uh, the, the main part of the Kurds, they are living in Turkey since uh, uh, 1,000 years. So um, the, the result of this idea was to restart the civil war inside, inside uh, Turkey. And you know that uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan began to bomb the PKK. Uh, right. And he said he would also bomb Daesh, but uh, in fact he, he did nothing against uh, Islamic Emirates, only very, very few things. But uh, for instance, uh, two days ago, he made 159 uh, bombing against uh, the PKK and zero bombing against Daesh. So um, when they said they are fighting against terrorism, they are absolutely not fighting against the Islamic Emirate, but only against the internal Kurdish opposition. That's all. And you have to know that uh, Mr. Erdogan is uh, now the, the main commander of the Islamic Emirate. In, uh, in the Western press, you can read that uh, some people are suspecting uh, Turkey to support the Islamic right, but that, that's not right at all. Inside Turkey, all the leaders of the opposition are saying that uh, Mr. Erdogan is the head of Daesh. And, uh, uh, for instance, uh, in the last uh, days, we had uh, evidences that uh, the, the 
people of Daesh who are wounded. They are uh, transported by the Turkish secret services inside Turkey, and they are um, they, they, they receive uh, 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 some treatment in uh, in a secret hospital inside Turkey under the supervision of the daughter of Mr. Erdogan. And at the same time, to make money, the uh, Daesh uh, is using first the, the traffic of drugs coming from Afghanistan, and two, uh, the oil they are taking inside uh, Iraq and uh, also inside uh, Syria, but mainly in Iraq. And this oil is sent to Europe by a, a new company. At the beginning, it was a, a company from uh, an other billionaire, but now it's a new company who is doing that, despite the, uh, the resolution of the United Nations. And this company is headed by Bilal Erdogan, the son of uh, uh, President Erdogan. So all this is very clear. And we have also a lot of evidences of how Turkey uh, is... Uh, um, giving weapons to uh, to the Islamic Emirates. So this idea to have an Islamic Emirate, to have a, a non-governmental organization like that one, to make uh, ethnic cleaning in uh, in Iraq, this idea was first in the uh, secret treaty between France. And Turkey in 2011, it was done by Alain Juppé for France and Ahmed Davutoglu for, for Turkey. That's why Turkey entered at war against Libya and against Syria. And now they want to realize this, both this Sinistan with Daesh and this fake Kurdistan with the Bazan family. Okay, we've just got a hard break coming up and we'll be right back with Thierry Maison. This is uh, an amazing insight. Uh, you won't hear this anywhere else. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We are still on the line with Thierry Maison of the Voltaire Network, the Réseau Voltaire. Uh, he is in Damascus, Syria, where he's been for a number of years. And he is, of course, an international journalist published in uh, Russia, in many, many other countries, and uh, an advisor to the uh, Syrian government. So Thierry is telling us essentially that the the caliph, uh, the head of ISIS, is not uh, this Baghdadi that you see, but it's actually President Erdogan of Turkey, and he is collaborating with General Allen, the ISIS czar here in Washington, to attempt to um, obviously to to preserve uh, ISIS and. Uh, and, and build it up. And that is two kids, as yeah. I reported before. Uh, the, the report I was giving is, is uh, written up on the Réseau Voltaire uh, website as well, that uh, his son and daughter are also part of the support uh, apparatus and uh, money apparatus of, of ISIS. Terry, please continue. Yes. Um, as, as you said just, uh, just now, uh, al-Baghdadi, the, the caliph of the Islamic Emirate, is only a, a front man for this organization, and he was choose because he is uh, from the family of the Prophet Muhammad. But he is not uh, uh, the real head of the of the system. Uh, behind him, you have two top men uh, who are belonging to the Turkish secret services and who are the, the real uh, commander in the fight. Hmm. And inside the headquarters of Daesh, quite all the other the officers are coming from the former Soviet Union, especially from Georgia, but also from uh, um, Turkmenistan and uh, other countries from former Georgia. And uh, right now, when you are hearing the discussion between the officer of Daesh by Toki Wolki, I read you, they are talking together only in Russian. They don't talk together in Arabic, but in Russian or in Turkish. So this is very clear. 
All this was organized by Turkey at the beginning for the CIA, but now for Turkey himself. Um, and uh, uh, you know this uh, way to play with terrorism is something very old in the Western countries. Of course, the CIA used terrorism since uh, Vietnam to uh, in different countries in, in the world, but at the beginning they, uh, they were doing terrorism by themselves, and now, uh, since uh, uh, 1978, they are using some Arab people to make terrorism for them. So they use these people in Afghanistan, after that they use them in Bosnia, in Europe, in Bosnia, in Chechnya, and uh, after that in Iraq, in uh, Libya, and in Syria. But uh, as the, the main leaders now of Daesh are coming from the former of Soviet Union, we can understand that they will use next Daesh against Russia, probably in the Caucasus, of course. But, Jerry, let me, um, let me ask, I want to ask you a couple of things in, uh, that are specific. Um, do you detect uh, a, an effort to direct Daesh, ISIS, towards the east? In other words, is, is the future plan to have Daesh attack Iran or to go into Chechnya? Or what are the targets that they're looking for in the near future? In, in fact, right now, we don't know. The only thing we know is that uh, uh, President Obama said he will, he will withdraw Daesh from the Middle East. But uh, probably he will send it uh, in, in the Russian Caucasus. But that's not sure. It, it looks uh, uh, probably like that. But he could also send them in Nigeria, in Libya, in the Balkans. But uh, the most logic is to send them in uh, in Russia. Um, you know, right now, we don't know how much people are fighting with Daesh. We have very different uh, analysis for that. Uh, it's between... Uh, uh, 50,000 and 200,000 people. That's a uh, very big difference. Uh, there's, uh, there's people in Iraq, and uh, most of them coming from outside, from other countries. At the beginning, they were fighting inside Syria with different names, the Free Syrian Army, the Al-Nusra Front, a lot of different names, but, but the same people who changed the name and who are now inside Daesh. And you have also with them some uh, former officer of Saddam Hussein. And this is very important to understand because these officers were not um, people from the Ba'ath Party, but they were the officers that Saddam Hussein used against Syria in 1978 to 1982 to support the Muslim Brotherhood against the Syrian Republic. And these people, they are now inside Daesh. Of course, they are old, but uh, uh, they, are, they are very well trained. And uh, uh, at the beginning, Daesh entered in Syria suddenly with a huge army, um, uh, in uh, May 2014, we were thinking that Daesh was only 800 people. But in July, when they attacked uh, Iraq, they were uh, more than 50,000, uh, uh, 50, uh, people. So, so 1,500. 1, 1,500. No, no, no. 15. No. When they, attack, when they attack Iraq, they were 50,000 people to attack Iraq. Okay, sounds like 50,000. So, 50, yes, suddenly they absorb a lot of small groups who were fighting against uh, the Syrian Republic to create this uh, new a terrorist organization. And the creation of this organization was decided 
in uh, secret meetings in Amman, in Jordania, in May uh, 2014, uh, we asked the, the copy of some uh, um, records of these uh, meetings. We are published by the PKK in, uh, in Turkey because in the secret meetings, of course, the Kurdish government was uh, um, the most important in this meeting. And you have also in this meeting the Barzani family with uh, um, the, uh, the, um, the head of the secret services of the uh, regional Kurdistan government in Iraq. So all these people together, they created Daesh under the supervision of the U.S. and Israel. And uh, it, it was a, a big success, and uh, um, it's difficult to understand why they have such big success in, uh, in Iraq. Of course, um, it's because the, there was a lot of uh, uh, officers of the Iraqi army who are part of the plot and who opened the door to these people, because they enter without fight. And uh, so they conquer all the all the Sunni stars, all the, the the Sunni part of uh, Iraq, especially Anandar, and uh, they they clean this country from all the minorities. And you know that in the Middle East, since uh, very old times, all the communities are living together in the same places. So this. There's something totally hurting the, the history of the Middle East. Okay, Jerry, I'm sorry. We, yes. We've run out of time. We want to thank you for these important insights. Let's maybe get you back next week or the week after for an update. But we want to thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, information that is absolutely unavailable anywhere else. So thanks again. Thierry Maison of the Voltaire Network reporting to us from Damascus, Syria, about how Erdogan of Turkey is the head of ISIS. And we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So you can get uh, information, analysis, exposés from Thierry Maison at the VoltaireNet.org. Réseau Voltaire, many languages. Uh, the most is available in French. But uh, English is uh, a lot. There's a lot of material there, too. So uh, this is worth uh, following in times like these. Now, we have to shift uh, over to Greece. We're going to try to get a report from Greece uh, later in the day in the program. Let's just mention a couple of things now. We've just had a conference uh, yesterday morning sponsored by Bernie Sanders on the Greek debt crisis. Uh, this was the – he's the ranking uh, member of the Senate uh, Budget Committee, I believe. So here we have the usual IMF in-house loyal opposition, Joseph Stieglitz. Then we have uh, Professor Galbraith, the younger, of the University of Texas. We have uh, this guy Kierkegaard, who works for the Peterson Institute. He is reliably uh, an austerity ghoul. And their debate, um, we'll take a look at this um, when we get the full uh, tapes, I guess, which I think they're going to, going to put up. Um, Kierkegaard is the most grotesque. He says that uh, the Greeks lost market access and therefore they have nobody but themselves to thank for austerity, and he seems to regard austerity as a kind of force of nature. It's something that just happens, right? It's imposed by the market. Well, of course, nothing of the kind. This was imposed by the political clique around Madman Schäuble, who ought to be in the, uh, the psychiatric clinic and not finance minister and currency dictator of Europe, which is what he seems to want to be. Uh, um, Galbraith then appeared on the Boom Bust program on, uh, I believe, the 30th. 
same day as this event. And he says that what there's a lot of talk about Plan B that he was setting up with Varoufakis. Now, this information is coming out rather slowly, so we want to um, follow it closely. But uh, the boom-bust interview with uh, Galbraith is that he was engaged in setting up, he says, just a clearing system in the finance ministry, that it was to improve transactions and to facilitate operations, all normal market mechanisms, says Galbraith. He says there was also at the same time plan B for a post-euro return to the drachma uh, in case the European Central Bank cut off the money and forced them uh, out. And he says that he was contributing to that research on the historical experience, California in 2002, Latin America, I'd like to know which ones, right? Was it Argentina, for example, in the most recent iteration, and Cyprus capital controls. Now, uh, if we go to the uh, website known as, uh, let's see, We'll get to this in just a second. Uh, it's a the the website is the um, uh, uh, well, this is we, essentially what we have is the interview or talk. It's a, it's a talk by Varoufakis to various uh, people, apparently hedge fund representatives, British, where he apparently thinking that this is going to remain confidential talks off the cuff. Now, what Galbraith says, maybe the whole story, or maybe it's Galbraith uh, maintaining you know, his pledge of confidentiality to Varoufakis, that he, he tends to minimize what happened. With Varoufakis, though, it's, um, it's rather uh, more ambitious. And he says that what he was doing, Varoufakis, in this uh, interview, that he was creating a parallel payment system, that this was part of plan B. He created a team of four or five people. Galbraith was the head of it. Uh, and their operation was to uh, take the, the website of the Greek uh, version of the Internal Revenue Service or Inland Revenue on the British side, the IRS, and what they did was, since every taxpayer has an account there under their system, they then created a second set of accounts, parallel accounts for all uh, taxpayers, with the idea that those could be used as a clearing system, that is to say, as a parallel uh, settlement system, in effect, uh, and uh, use that then for a limited period of time to gain uh, a window of opportunity to be able to, um, to you know, to tote up, to settle, to clear uh, uh, pluses and minuses in everybody's account. So in the course of this, he, he because the uh, money part was controlled by the Troika, the European uh, Central Bank in particular, he had to go through his friend who was controlling the uh, a related part of this bureaucracy to hack into his own ministry's uh, revenue department uh, and uh, and essentially begin to set up these parallel uh, accounts with parallel passwords. So the idea was this would be an alternative payment system. He said his problem was to take it from the five people who were involved to the thousand people that would have been needed. He, fe he felt that he couldn't do this under the uh, scrutiny of the European Central Bank, that Tsipras had been working with him on this before they even got into the government. Uh, so secret reserve accounts for all taxpayers that could have then been transformed into drachmas at any point. Well, I hope that's true, and I hope there's more to it than that, right? Sometimes we remember with advantages. I hope every every bit of this is uh, is is true, uh, and I hope it went even further. Uh, again, Galbraith tends to minimize it. Varoufakis might have some interest in uh, in making it look bigger than it was, but certainly that's that's an important part of it. But of course. You, you can educate public opinion without doing it yourself. Right? You, could have, you could have called for uh, 
lecture tours by people who could have talked about the abuses of central banks, why they're private, what it means that they're private, why that is unacceptable, why they have caused this depression. And then you could have educated public opinion using cutouts, using people with whom you have very little or no public connection whatsoever. And that could have been used with a word here to the various media here, put this on, get this out into the public. Uh, that could have been done. You don't have to do it yourself so that the troika comes and finds you and then begins to take their own measures. So the idea uh, with this is uh, I think the most detailed version in a, uh, a publication is in the Italian uh, Corriere della Sera of Milan on the 27th of June, uh, July, sorry, just this past week. And you can find the entire tape and a transcript at a group called Official Monetary and Finance Institutions Forum. Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. You can listen to the tape. You can read a transcript. Uh, I think this takes it further. Uh, what, what I don't think we have there in the cursory view I've been able to give it is a discussion about how this central bank with the drachma would work differently. In other words, credit for production, credit creation for job creation, for infrastructure, for the uh, millions of new productive jobs that would be needed for the massive investments in uh, infrastructure and related questions. So uh, that, I think, is what we can get out of this uh, extraordinary interest now coming from uh, Bernie Sanders, from Russia Today, and from the others. Uh, Russia, I hope to have time at the end. Russia Today looks like they figured out that uh, Rand Paul is a goner, and maybe they'll switch to, uh, to somebody like, like Bernie Sanders. That would be a plus for them. Do it. Go ahead and do it. Better that than Rand Paul. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Now, we want to get a report from Athens. Let's just uh, sum up what we've just gone through. We have this uh, recording of Varoufakis talking with a couple of British hedge fund operators on the 16th of July, published on Monday, the 27th of July, authorized by Varoufakis. This is... Uh, Available, the recording and the text at the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. I think the biggest write-up I've seen is in Corriere della Sera of Milan. But yesterday here in Washington, we had the Bernie Sanders-sponsored Stiglitz, Galbraith, Kierkegaard uh, Forum uh, with various uh, opinions. And we also had Galbraith on the boom-bust program of RT tending to underestimate this, but that's perhaps just um, tactical. So uh, we've also got the fact that uh, although uh, Lagarde had been claiming that she was going to get debt reduction, uh, we're now told that the IMF staff is telling her that she can't take part in any more of these Greek bailout operations. So that would be sort of a bait and switch, a dirty trick, right? Pass, you pass the austerity cuts and then the IMF leaves, leaves you to the tender mercy of Schäuble or something like that. So let's go to Athens and hear from uh, Michael Chiotinas. Michael, welcome. Uh, now, what, what we need to talk about mainly, is this new bailout deal. Right. Uh, these, these, all, these things are all very interesting, but the heart of the matter is this new bailout. Uh, the process of negotiations is on. Uh, the, the deal is not secured yet. This is, the, this is going to be the third bailout package, so-called bailout, um, in the five years, the first one, is, is a, this is the third one. The first one was 2010, the second 2012. Now, what can we expect from this new bailout? There's no way around it. This deal is the worst bailout since the beginning of the crisis in Greece. I cannot even begin to describe how bad it is, uh, how brutal politically, how destructive 
economically and uh, ultimately how inhumane the conditionalities um, for the Greek society. Um, at that point, we should probably acknowledge the fact that this kind of brutality cannot have anything to do with economic issues, right? It cannot be a matter of the lender's uh, economic interests in an immediate way. In other words, in terms of, uh, quote-unquote, wanting to get their money back. This is insane. Uh, this deal is catastrophic economically for all sides involved. So what is this? And why is it so brutal? Now, one has to have the presence of mind to not get infuriated by this apparent capitulation by the Greek government. We have to think that this brutality could not be anything but political provocation, in my view. This deal will drive away even the most pro-Euro forces in the Greek society. So we can think of this exercise in political bullying by the German government as an attempt to make the Greek government and the Greek people want to exit the Eurozone. Uh, or, even if they don't, you know, make the Greek economy suffer uh, so, so badly that, that at least a Euro exit will come very shortly, very shortly, you know what I mean? Because, make no mistake, this deal is not only destructive, but most importantly, unworkable. It is designed to fail. Now, the targets can never be reached. Um, they will never be reached leading to yet another round of crisis and negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing is over. Grexit is still on the table, probably more than ever. So I'm approaching the point. This is an exercise in, exercise in political bullying, application of brute force, and ultimately a provocation. The heart of the matter is, um, as far as the Greek government is concerned, faced with a provocation, what do you do? What is the appropriate response to something like that? Uh, I should say that, yes, a Euro exit, economically speaking, may be the best option. Schäuble has worked uh, very hard to make it appear as the best option anyway. But there is also a legitimate case to be made for um, not falling into this potential trap, uh, clearly set by the other, si by the other side, uh, for not following the narrow economic approach, if I may say. Uh, to put it simply, maybe we shouldn't be eager to eat the bait. You see what I'm saying? I but, Michael, let me, I think uh, the, the way it looks right now is that the question is, uh, now that uh, Tsipras uh, it remains in power, Syriza remains in power, are they, in fact, preparing a plan B in the increasingly likely case that that becomes unavoidable? In other words, I think Schäuble's plan is, I'll push you out of the euro, and then you'll collapse because you won't know what to do. You won't know how to seize, or you won't dare seize the central bank. There'll be countervailing forces from the Greek oligarchy. Maybe you'll have a civil war. I'll occupy you with some kind of a uh, of a force. I think the big question we we went through in some detail the parallel payment system that Varoufakis says he was setting up, and that's all to the good, all good that he created a parallel payment system that could have been switched to drachmas, right? But you've got to do more, right? You've got to have the banknotes ready. He says the big uh, bottleneck was to go from five people on the team to a thousand, and he couldn't figure out how to do that uh, without having the uh, the word leak out, right? But it seems to me the, the, the reason to stay in power now, to hold on to power, is to use the levers of power to prepare the return to the drachma, again, it's going to be forced on you by somebody else, but it's becoming more and more likely. The important thing is to leave to leave the euro, but to do so successfully. Maybe, maybe, but we may we can say that there are two opposing arguments. We and we should be able to see the virtues of both arguments, both sure. the side both the side that wants to accept the deal uh, and work something out, and the side that wants the government to reject the deal. And but why don't we why don't we see those two in dialectical unity? In other words, right now you've got no choice but to accept whatever it is, right? Within you know your limits of you know fakery or whatever you can do, right? In other words, take evasive action. Uh, yes. But 
very soon that's going to turn into you're going to you know the the European Central Bank is going to cut off money and then what do you do you must be ready right one of the one of the hedge fund guys in this tape says to Varoufakis you really didn't have a plan b did you and he said well we did uh, unfortunately what he talks about is not yet a plan b although it's an important part of it right the, this whole question of payment systems you know swift or whatever it is that that would come into play uh, to be sure, I, you know, it seems to me the big question is, are they using the time now to get ready for what looks increasingly likely, which is the grim exit, the Grexit scenario? Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. So once again, uh, my uh, my view on Greece is this is all good. Varoufakis should be congratulated and Cyprus, too, for doing at least this much to prepare for what may happen, right? Every government has the imperative duty, the moral responsibility to plan for all eventualities, for all. And that's got to be kept se secret. Then you use all the uh, institutional tools you have to keep that uh, secret. So this is, a, this is a clever and creative idea. Uh, in a transition here in the United States, these problems would probably not arise because we have a sovereign currency and, uh, and would use the same payment system that we started with. So we would seize the central bank either in, uh, as a whole or in part and push these uh, bunglers out of the boardroom uh, and, and get busy. But in Greece, they have this extra problem of managing the transition back to the drachma. And again, I this is not anything I wanted. If you've listened to this uh, program over the last couple of years, I'm not in favor of, uh, of breaking up the euro, uh, but uh, sometimes you've got to be ready to leave it, at least for a time, right? It doesn't have to be a metaphysical decision for all eternity. But given the madman Schäuble in Berlin, you've got to be ready. And I think uh, Galbraith had a wrong analysis in his uh, boom bust interview. He said, well, the, the uh, Schäuble people wanted to push Greece out and the Greeks uh, were basically arguing they wanted to stay in, so therefore they couldn't threaten Schäuble. Sure you can. You can say, if it's just another step down the road, right? You push me out, I'm out, I showed that this can be done successfully, and by the way, with the debt moratorium, I bring down the Deutsche Bank and the other uh, institutions that own you, Schäuble, so uh, watch out, right? There will be, you know, I can't stop you from attacking, but I can retaliate and you won't like it. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Now, the U.S. Uh, internal situation in regard to the Congress, right? The House of Representatives went home yesterday, July 30th. That's going to be the August recess. The Senate is leaving town right now. This, of course, has been a disaster, right? We must remember that the reactionary Republicans, the austerity ghouls, control the U.S. Congress, and they are demanding their pound of flesh. We could not get even a three-year, $365 billion highway bill through because some lunatic Republican from the Austrian school was not happy with that. Uh, instead, we've come up with a stopgap measure that uh, it's six or seven billion dollars, and it gets the highway projects through uh, essentially to uh, to what, September, October, I guess, a few months worth. Uh, some extra money for the Veterans Administration, hospitals, um, and so forth. Now, we are going now to have the Congress come back at the end of August, uh, essentially uh, after Labor Day, the two chambers will resume their dubious activities, right? The Republicans will then be in high dudgeon uh, the logjam will be enormous. There will be 12 appropriations bills from the appropriations uh, committees, right? the College of Cardinals in the House. Uh, all of those are chock full of austerity uh, measures, genocidal austerity killer cuts against the American people. They'll still have to come up with a permanent highway bill. There will be the Iran question. Uh, there will be other uh, issues. So uh, we are now within sight of a government shutdown, not just a government shutdown, but a government default.
In other words, the national bankruptcy of the United States is once more on the agenda, thanks to the party of national sabotage, the wreckers of the United States, the the pro-Chinese party, if you will, the party that is determined, it would seem, to give us Chinese world domination, the Republican Party, right? With their pockets bulging with foreign gold, right? There's going to be the Export-Import Bank. They're still trying to sabotage uh, that one. Uh, again, ideology, corruption, bribery, all gone wild. Uh, the war on women heating up, right? Their favorite gambit, the attack on Planned Parenthood. And that includes little Rand, the great libertarian who wants to deprive women of, uh, of their autonomy in these intensely personal choices. Um, bad. Very bad. So um, we're going to have, even though Mitch McConnell promised us that he would not shut down the U.S. government, uh, he, he may well. So if they don't agree on these 12 appropriations bills, then all or some of the federal government will shut down. And then the debt ceiling increase has to occur in uh, November, I guess, after the you know, sort of non-election, the off-year election, which this year is, as people know, mainly um, local races. Now, uh, in the middle of all this, uh, we're looking at the Republican field. We see the loudmouth Trump uh, triumphing. He's ahead nationally. He's ahead in New Hampshire. He's within two points or so of uh, the Koch candidate Walker in the uh, Iowa caucuses. We're told that Trump is indeed building the kind of uh, ground organization without which you cannot do anything in Iowa, right? You have to have a ground organization. Uh, he seems to be acquiring it. But the, the interesting one is Little Rand Paul. I think if we write the history of U.S. ideology in the near future, we may say it was in the summer of 2015 that the libertarian movement began to die, to go deservedly into that oblivion and that bad night. Little Rand is cratering. He's cratering because he started his campaign on an aircraft carrier. He's cratering because he flip-flopped on many issues. His opportunism, his scoundrel character, too much in, in evidence. Uh, and in particular, his campaign against the Iran nuclear accord has shocked his dupes and former followers. We're getting reports of a little Rand's people burning their T-shirts. Can you believe it? They're burning their I stand with Rand T-shirts. $35 T-shirts are being burned by disillusioned Paul Tards, and sometimes they get together and have a burning bee. <laughs> they, they've got a burning bee going on, and uh, that is reported in the uh, various, uh, the various uh, media. And all kinds of people are turning against him. I would point in particular to uh, Justin... Raimondo of anti-war, right? This is sort of the uh, the high priest of uh, libertarian anti-war uh, ideology, and his column is entitled "Rand Paul Fraud, Failure, and Liar." How about that? As the smoke wafted wafted up into the already smoggy Los Angeles air, a group of young libertarians watched as Jehel Aram burned his Stand with Rand t-shirts. He had two of them. And he had been hobnobbing and phone banking with little Rand. But now it's over. And we've got articles on Mondo Weiss. <laughs> what prompted such a fiery stunt? The son of Ron, the son of the leprechaun, opposes the deal with Iran over its nuclear program, faulting the agreement for lifting sanctions. We'll have more of this in just a minute. Welcome back to uh, World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in 
Washington, D.C., the last day of July uh, 2015. Is the libertarian movement, uh, it is an artificial movement, and we'll talk about this for a second, is it dying? Uh, is this the beginning of the collapse of the Republican Party in general? Right? We know that we have, a, we have some kind of a feud going on. Cruz is attacking Mitch McConnell, rightly pointing out that he's a liar. Of course he's a liar. He's a tool of Koch. Speaking of Koch, Trump is not getting any money from Koch. What does this mean? Right? All that money the Koch brothers poured into the Republican Party. And now a tin horn demagogue comes along and uh, essentially... Uh, that money may be lost. Now, remember, we can look at uh, Trump from any number of points of view. We've already got uh, the Tax Wall Street Party to thank for a, uh, a vignette showing the head of Trump as a wrecking ball. And sure enough, uh, Miley Cyrus sitting on top of the wrecking ball. Uh, this wrecking ball is knocking down the edifice of the uh, reactionary Republican Party. The other one that comes to mind is Samson and Delilah. Remember, Samson uh, was very good against the Philistines as long as he had his uh, hair and his strength, but he uh, betrayed his secret to Delilah, who cut his hair off. He was blinded, and he was brought into the Philistine temple. But as his hair began to grow back, he had enough strength to pull down the columns. The roof of the Philistine temple came down. And the entire Philistine ruling class and Samson were crushed in the process. Do we see something here that is comparable to the present and the coming uh, situations? Well, I think we may, in the sense that Trump may well be able to pull down this rotten edifice of the Philistine reactionary Republican Party, but also uh, himself uh, be uh, brought down under the wreckage under the rubble of the Philistine temple. In this case, we're using the term Philistine just culturally, right? That the Republicans are barbarians and uh, boors and they have no taste and they're Philistines, right? They're babbits, right? This kind of thing, right? The bourgeoisie, as H.L. Mencken uh, called them. So all of this is happening. Remember where libertarianism comes from. It is a foreign body in American history. Don't tell me that Alexander Hamilton was a follower of the Austrian school of political economy. Not George Washington, not Alexander Hamilton, and not any of them, not one of them. Because the Austrian school more or less came into existence after the American Civil War, the United States using protectionist policies, at least two out of the three that you'd have to have, uh, in particular a protective tariff and massive construction of internal improvements at public expense, even if they're only in one state, that is to say the transcontinental railroad, the U.S. embarked on a huge boom. And as long as you had greenbacks, the third element, a government-controlled currency, the United States took off on its way, on our way, to world industrial supremacy. So that's the American system of Henry Clay. A national bank, the currency, the internal improvements, infrastructure, we would say today, and the protective tariff. These are things we need. We want that protective tariff back. We want to seize the Federal Reserve and make that into the National Bank of the United States. Uh, but Little Rand, of course, representing the Austrian school. Where does that come from? Well, the United States was doing so well under this protectionist system that uh, Prince Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck of Germany, Prussia, uh, said, look, uh, we're getting nowhere with free trade. The British are looting us. We're going to go to protectionism, too. Uh, and this caused quite a shock because that, at that point, Germany began to pull ahead of Austria-Hungary. And the Habsburgs in Vienna— the Kook Empire, as it's been called, uh, the, the Habsburgs in their decadent uh, paradise of Vienna said, look, we have to have uh, a, a school of economics, we'll call it the Austrian school, to oppose the German or historical school. 
So the difference is the Austrian school is the psychological school, starts in this period, the 1870s, 1880s, and the alternative is the German school. But of course, the German school and the American school are practically identical. The cross uh, linkages are very strong. Above all, Friedrich List, uh, who was uh, one of the great experts in this in the German-speaking area. And, of course, the fact that Bismarck was consciously imitating the success of the U.S. under protectionism. So uh, the Austrian school crippled the Habsburg Empire. A lot of tragedies come out of this. But then uh, when this was um, you know, not successful, it was kept alive by the London School of Economics. So the psychological school, the Austrian school, kept alive by the London School of Economics so that somebody like um, David Rockefeller could come there in the 1930s. And of course, since he was uh, practically uh, illiterate, he had to have somebody to do his papers. And that was, that was von Hayek. And he later brought von Hayek over to the United States and he brought von Mises over to the United States. And a lot of this got into the Mount Pelerin Society, the most sinister uh, academic or theoretical organization. It's up there with Bilderberg and Trilateral, Skull and Bones, whatever you want. The, the, the Mount Pelerin Society meeting in Switzerland in, I believe, 1947 or thereabouts, uh, set up an international network determined to fight back against the overwhelming success of the New Deal. But, of course, that success was not palatable to oligarchs, right, to uh, essentially uh, anti-human uh, people concerned about aristocratic privilege and all the rest. They didn't want that. They hated the New Deal, so they began to roll that back. And it, it went essentially through academia, through endowed professorships, people like the Koch brothers creating or helping to create the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. So you can see whether it's David Rockefeller bringing von Hayek and von Mises into the United States, right? Von Hayek, who went on then to be the one of the main inspirations of Thatcher in Britain, Thatcher Milk Snatcher, who destroyed the coal mining industry and so many others in Britain, uh, and then von Mises, right? The great uh, Puba and Eminence Gris of this school. Is this coming to an end? In other words, all of these libertarians flocked into the Paul Tard faction, the Ron Paul, Rand Paul faction. Is that collapsing because of too many betrayals, right? Even the dumbest dupe will, in the end, begin to figure out that he's being robbed blind. And I think that's what you can detect. I seem to see that the Daily Paul website is gone. No more Daily Paul. This is now something else, but it's not the Daily Poll. Uh, as I say, it looks like the people at Russia today, RT, they have been tragically smitten by the Paul Tard faction. We can see why, right? They, they think that that will cause problems here in the United States, put it that way. Who can blame them? I don't, I don't uh, really blame this all on them. It would be smarter for them not to do this. And indeed, maybe they're quitting. Maybe they're stopping to do that, right? Maybe they they seem to be looking at Bernie Sanders or Trump or anybody, but little Rand is now retreating into the shadows. Is this the twilight of the libertarian fraud? This artificial movement brought over here? We sure think so. And all of you libertarians out there who are looking for something authentic, come to us. Come to the Tax Wall Street Party. Subscribe to our briefing at taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com taxwallstreetparty at gmail.com and we'll be glad to give you a free subscription to our matchless daily briefing start with the triple series on Allen and Isis we'll be back next week on World Crisis Radio